an achievement. I had well, is it not an achievement today? <laughs> well, those days only six graduated, so it's still an achievement today, Prof. Thank you, sir. <laughs> So um, I spent some time helping to set up the legal department of the prison service uh, while I had enrolled at the school of uh, Ghana School of Law. And the following year, the director had it converted to national service for me because those days our mates could do national service. And after prison service, I was not interested in enlisting because I had already decided to teach. So I went back to Legon as a teaching assistant and then got a scholarship to Yale University. And after my LLM, I came back home and I started teaching and I rose through the ranks to become a full professor in 2002. In 2007, I was recruited into the UN as a deputy special representative of the Secretary General for Rule of Law in Liberia. I was there for four years on the rank of Assistant Secretary General. After four years, I had had enough and my leave of absence had expired, so I had to decide whether to come back or to stay in the UN. I opted to come back home and started, continued my teaching. In 2012, I was appointed director of the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. I was a director for six years. In 2015, I was appointed by the Secretary General of the UN to be part of a panel to examine the peacekeeping environment and make recommendations for the future because it was clear that the environment was undergoing change and the UN had to adapt its ways. So after what is called the HIPPO report, which is now the uh, Bible, so to speak, of peace operations, no longer peacekeeping as we recommended. So that has been it, up and down, helping to train senior mission leaders for UN missions, helping to improve the quality of staff, particularly the police. So um, I've been part of the UN's police com commander's course to expose police leaders at a certain level to the range of duties they have to undertake on peacekeeping. So, Mr. Chairman, in 2018, July 2018, I retired. I had attained 60 years on 29th October 2017, but the university has an arrangement not to disrupt the academic year. So, everybody retires on 31st July of the following year. So those of us born after um, 31st July, nicknamed the Bubra crowd, or get uh, some time more than our age mates born in the earlier part of the year. So I retired and I was given a post-retirement contract and I'm back in the faculty teaching writing, researching, and that is what has brought me here today. Thank you. Very well. Honorable Minority Leader. Chairman, let me thank you for the opportunity and to join you in congratulating Professor Rita Mensa Bonsu. By chairman was doing so, I know that in her CV she asked me bound for. Is the president aware of that name? Because a letter signed by him 18th May 2020. Do I take it that we go 
with the presence were Professor Henrietta J. A. N. Mensa Bonsu, or the Nibonful is part and parcel of your name. No, sir. That is the common way of referring to your maiden name after you have changed. I've been married 40 years. Chairman, the second page, I know that she attended the that's a famous Wiggy here or Wesley Girls. They are remembered for something. You want to share that with us? What are they remembered for? They are motto. I see a lot of uh, young people who want to speak with it with pride. You want to share it with the committee? The school motto? Yes. yes. Live pure, speak true, right, wrong, follow the king. How has that guided your life as an academic? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, when you are brought up to speak true, then you know that not seeing the truth and walking by it is not an option. And so in our school in those days, being described as dishonest because you had told a lie was equivalent to a capital punishment. And you were supposed to live pure. They were raising us as Christian young women, and we were supposed to live, show by example the faith that we believed in. You were supposed to right wrong, because if anything wrong is going on and you are aware of it, you are supposed not just to look on it, but to take steps to correct it. Chairman, that leads me to my next question. Do you see any wrongs? Do you see any wrongs in the 1992 constitution that you want to write by the Wiggy motto? Write some wrongs. Are there wrongs in the 1992 constitution which will be your Bible and living document as you go to the High Office of Supreme Court that you want to write? Any Mr. provision? Mr. Chairman, um, the constitution. The Constitutional Review Committee did an excellent job going through it, but much of the time they said that the, the provisions should remain. I share that position because a constitution is not something that you change every day when you find something inconvenient. What you do is to work around it and let it shape your life rather than the other way around, because otherwise then you see this to be the basic law. So maybe it could be improved in some ways. Already it has undergone some amendment in, on citizenship and so on. But speaking for myself, I would like to see it work more before we touch it. Now you've just mentioned citizenship. Under the Citizenship Act, what is the basis of establishing that one is a citizen of Ghana? Your born in Ghana or born elsewhere with a, at least a grandparent uh, as a Ghanaian would, would be sufficient. Is a birth certificate or a baptismal certificate a relevant document for that purpose? A birth certificate generally testifies to the uh, citizenship of the country that owns you. And it's for that reason that a foundling is deemed to be Ghanaian and definitely would be given a Ghanaian birth certificate, even though there's no evidence of the person's birth. Chairman, thank you. I know that the nominee has very rich background and has contributed enormously to Ghana's criminal jurisprudence, no doubt about that. Ghana Prison Service, what do you want to see change about the institution and the inmates of prisons in Ghana, given your experience. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Hmm. Prisons, always a big issue. Sometimes we don't want to confront the fact that as human, having set standards of behavior, some will fall short and we would have to take them in hand to bring them in line. So nobody wants to build prisons. That was my experience as Deputy Special Representative in Liberia, that building prisons was a big deal. Nobody wanted, no donor wanted to go home and report that they built prisons. They would rather go home and report that they built schools or hospitals. So it's the same for governments. And yet, like coffins, somebody has to be a coffin maker, or else how are you going to bury people? So we need to build 
more prisons. We definitely do. And then we need to um, have fewer custodial sentences. And uh, I would crave your the, uh, indulgence of the honorable members to, to urge you to pass fewer legislation that require custodial sentences. Now, this means that we have to work on the alternative sentences, community service. It's always a touchy issue, believe it or not, because when a crime is committed, there are various interests, and people don't want to think that people who have hurt them have got off lightly. And yet, we cannot keep this on. Once on a trip to in someone prison, a busload of uh, prisoners came from the courts. They were all young men between the ages of 18 and 25. And I said, this is the flower of Ghana youth. After they've spent so long here, they are of no more use to us. So we really need to look at our sentencing also so that we can decongest the prisons. But definitely there are some people who belong there. And we, we, we can adopt however enlightened um, regimes we want, but some would need handling. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, Prof, criminal reforms to improve the administration of justice, what would be your take? What can we do? The slow, tortuous, cumbersome trial process, justice delayed, they say is justice denied. What will you see change in our criminal administration system? Thank you very much. Uh, sometimes some of the delay is built in, and some you'd, you'd say are uh, quote and unquote man-made. Because when people have confronted the state and are in trouble with the state, you want to make sure that they've had every chance to um, make their case. We have a presumption of innocence. So you, you cannot hurry the matter until you have brought it to a conclusion. Perhaps we could do more plea bargaining. I hesitate in using the word because in America, where it's very popular, it's also very touchy because people think that uh, the, the, the whole process of uh, criminal justice should not be treated like a market uh, transaction. And yet, if you don't adopt some of those uh, mechanisms, you, everybody will end up in prison. And for what end? Then there's the possibility of uh, paying money, particularly for um, uh, crimes of uh, embezzlement and so on, when the state's interest is involved. It's a good way. At the same time, you, we have to be mindful of the image of the system as serving rich people, big people better, so they don't get to go to prison because they can pay, and so on. All the same, these things can be managed so that we have fewer um, sentences to prison and um, we can um, hurry the system so that there are no unreasonable delays as the, the, the Constitution takes. The, even the Constitution recognizes that sometimes there will be delay. That's why it qualifies it with unreasonable delays. Then Ch there are the juvenile side, Mr. Chairman. Juvenile justice is very much on my heart because um, the young people need a chance to get their lives back. At the same time, when they've broken the law, somebody must take them in hand and work on them. And uh, I think we could use another look or a tweaking of the, of the system so that we don't send too many young children. For example, the last time I did research at the um, senior correctional home in uh, Admamobi, there were a number of young boys there on defilement charges. Now, some of these would not have ended in prison, but for the fact that under our law, there's no opportunity for what they call Romeo and Juliet statutes. So however young the boy is, if the girl is uh, below a certain age, 
then he gets into the criminal justice system. Maybe we need to tweak some of those things too. Thank you. Chairman, I note that the nominee who has been at the Supreme Court will be part of the law lords who would exercise... Sorry, sir. They say they can't hear me. Prof, are you okay? I am, sir. Thank you. They said they couldn't hear me, sir. I wish I could share how uncomfortable or discomforting it is to have this uh, COVID. Where are you from? <laughs> uh, Chairman, the nominee will join respected superior court judges at the highest court of our land, and you will be exercising appellate supervisory and exclusively the interpretation role of the Supreme Court Criminal matters will be referred to you at the highest court. Elucidate on it. Why in Ghana, why is the burden of proof based on proof beyond reasonable doubt and not proof beyond shadow of doubt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The burden of proof is proof beyond reasonable doubt because otherwise you would not be able to prove anything. Proof beyond the, the shadow of a doubt is a level of certainty, a degree of certainty, which will be difficult to establish. I believe that proof beyond reasonable doubt is a fair standard for both parties. After all, in civil cases, we, we only need a balance of probabilities. So when you are proving beyond reasonable doubt, you are at least making sure that the penalties that will be imposed have been earned. In, criminal, in, in, in the criminal justice arena, we have all kinds of interests. It's not just the victim and the perpetrator. It's the state, it's the public. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, when you hear that a particularly heinous crime has been committed in Azerbaijan, you can get upset in your home. So there are all these interests, and yet people must not be punished until it has been shown that they have earned it. So I believe that it would be an unreasonable burden on the prosecution to insist that there should be proof beyond a shadow of a doubt. Coupled with this proof beyond reasonable doubt, it's also the presumption that when there's doubt, it must be resolved in favor of the accused. I think between the two, a fair job can be done. Chairman, may I now, if the nominee has a copy of the Constitution, should Parliament approve of your nomination, you would subscribe to what is referred to as a judicial oath. And I'm just paraphrasing part of it. And with Chairman's permission, I quote, I will truly and faithfully perform the functions of my office without fear or favor, affection or ill will, and that I will at all times uphold, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and the laws of the Republic of Ghana. How do you intend to cruise with these words as a justice of the Superior Court of Ghana? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Generally speaking, I am a very fair-minded person. I keep an open mind about people, and I'm broad-minded enough to accept new um, ideas if it turns out that the ideas are worth accepting. When you are dealing with justice, the people in your hands are vulnerable, and so you must understand that they are individuals facing the might of the state. And therefore, you should not take out any personal, personal feelings that would prejudice um, their case. You have to be clinical about it, and that is what we try to teach students every day, that the law, in applying the law, you cannot form an emotional bond and do the wrong thing. You have to be clinical 
about, about it. And so, without fear or favor, affection or ill will, I interpret to be, to be as clinical about it as possible so that your personal feelings don't intrude. You have not been hired to uh, perform those personal things. You are working on behalf of the people, on behalf of the state, and that is what should happen. Thank you. Chairman, may I refer the nominee to Article 122 of the 1992 Constitution, and probably just to learn from her, criminal contempt, criminal contempt, and Parliament wanting to exercise uh, 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 under uh, contempt of Parliament, uh, educate us on it. When Parliament says that it wants to charge somebody for contempt, related to contempt within the practice within the judicial system of Ghana, and then just make a comment on Article 122, contempt of Parliament. What can Parliament do and not do relative to contempt? Thank you very much. The institutions of state have to be protected against conduct that undermines their standing because they exist for the general good. It is a subversion of the general good when the institutions are attacked such that their, their, their purpose and worth and so on are undermined. The same goes for parliament as for um, the courts because for many people, the courts remain the last hope. And it is not good if people undermine the efficacy of the judicial system and so on. Then what are you leaving them with but self-help, which nobody wants? I know that Parliament has this opportunity, but Article 1253 also talks about the judicial power vesting in the judiciary. And so any exercise of power that amounts to judicial power may be crossing the separation of powers line. Chairman, thank you very much. I note again that the nominee has some writings. Ghana Police Service. As you may prove, you were just driving from Legon towards where you used to head last year, the Center for International Affairs. And out on the street, heading towards Medina, you saw an MTTU policeman slap a truck truck driver and want to pull him out of the car. What would be your fair sense with your respect for criminal law in Ghana, your intuitive sense? Mr. Chairman, people don't lose their rights because they have offended. Indeed, the fair trial provisions in the Constitution arise only when you have broken the law. So is slapping a torture driver part of the work of a police officer? A police officer who is enforcing law and is doing so by means that the law does not support has to pay a price for it. They, they know the ways in which they can do their work. They know the powers of arrest they have. None of those would permit that kind of slapping. So the law gives you an a, a chance with all kinds of powers to be able to do your work. But when you exceed those powers, then you must be taken to task. I certainly, I would not confront an angry policeman and get a slap and apology later, but I would definitely contact, I would definitely contact somebody in the police hierarchy and make a complaint. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Article 127, uh, within the context of the principle of separation of powers, we have the three co-equal arms of government. Do you conceive of the judicial judiciary of Ghana as financially independent and autonomous within the meaning of Article 1271 of the Constitution. You may refer to it. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's always a thorny issue when the resources of the uh, country are controlled by the executive, and the legislature has the power of the purse, and the judiciary needs money to function. But I think there's a reasonable control to enable the judiciary to, by and large, stay independent. No money can be spent without parliament approval. So that in itself operates as a check on the executive. Because let's face it, somebody has to take charge of the resources and allocate. So it's always a problem of um, the executive taking the estimates and working with them and so on. And yet it's the one who shares what's in the pot, who really has to know what is needed. In Liberia, for example, the judiciary makes a direct application to parliament. Even though parliament controls the power of the purse, let's say that the purse is in the pocket of the executive and parliament controls the, the, the power to open it. So whatever happens, somebody would control um, the, the expenditure. But even the principle of separation of powers does not talk of such total and unrelated separation. They say they are separate but equal, separate but interdependent. So it's unavoidable that the one who controls the first string, strings can exercise some control. But fortunately, the executive doesn't do both. So the three arms have to cooperate so that the protection that the Constitution offers the judiciary through the legislature would be actualized. Yes, Honorable Minister for Western Housing. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm also glad in that uh, one of my lecturers is being elevated, maybe probably in the evening of a year to sit in the Supreme Court. She always wore a smile when she was lecturing. And I'm grateful to her for um, contributing to my um, education. And now I sit as a lawyer. Thank you, Madam. I'll just ask a qu one question from your CV and I'll ask a couple of questions and then I'll be done. Um, you said um, you have three children. Uh, may I know whether you were blessed with a child who had your intellectual bent? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm more than blessed. My, my three daughters, two of whom are here, uh, the third one could not be here because she has an online meeting with her university. She's reading for her PhD at Oxford, oh. and she has a meeting with the university today, so she could not be here. Yes. But the three of them are doing very well. Two are lawyers, mm. start making, beginning to make waves themselves. The eldest is the managing director of the family company. She is the one r r responsible for the national science and maths quiz, and I believe all of you know the, the ways she's been making on, in, in education. So I will say that I, 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 the grace of God has abounded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, my substantive questions. There is a rule of evidence that he who alleges must prove and the burden of proof can change. In the presidential election petition, it was the electoral commissioner, Dr. Farijan, who declared President Mahama, based on the constitutional arithmetic that he had 50 plus one of the votes cast. And ergo, the president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. Some juries believe that the burden of proof should have been on Dr. Farijan, the declarant of the results, who should have proved to the Supreme Court how he arrived at 50 plus one. And this would have curtailed eight months of laborious trial. What is your view on the burden of proof, the presidential election petition? 
while, thank you, Mr. Chairman, while I understand why you would um, take that position, some things are easier to prove than others. And a person who is alleging that his rights have been infringed is the one who has to show how the right has been infringed. And then the uh, processes can continue. If you reverse the burden, then anybody, I'm not just thinking of uh, the presidential petition, but anybody can make an allegation and then call upon you to prove. That is why even in the law of thoughts, the, the evidential rule about um, the, the, the case speaking for itself, res ipsa loquitur, is an exception to the rule. So maybe with more experience, we should be able to determine that uh, in such a situation, it's a res ipsa situation. But if you had no basis for complaining about the computation, you wouldn't have gone to court. So surely there's nothing wrong with you being called upon to prove how you came by that position so that the person against whom you are alleging uh, improper conduct or indolence or dishonesty would then have a chance to answer. So I can understand why you would say that, but I think all things considered, we are better off leaving things as they are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, I asked a very interesting question on the review jurisdiction of the um, um, Supreme Court. And I think uh, being a lecturer and with a very elastic mind, I would might want to add this question again, because I have a view different from the answer I got. Relating to the review jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, it is the position of some jurists that the seven judges who will sit on the case should not include the original five justices who dealt with the case at the first instance. The reason is that the five justices who originally sat on the case always take the position that we have made up our minds. Don't disturb us with the facts. Do you share this view that the seven new justices should review the case? And if not, why not? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not a, a pseudo appellate jurisdiction. And for that reason, it must be protected. It is a good mechanism to get them to take another look. And the practice has been to add people who were not originally part of the panel. You, you cannot assume that those who first had the case were in the wrong, and that a, a completely different panel would judge differently. We have to have some assurance that when the Supreme Court has given a decision, it is final. So yes, there is the power of review. Yes, you, have, uh, you can ask for a review, but it can, the, the, the process cannot go on endlessly. My final question, Mr. Chairman. Prof, do you consider the Constitution as a political document, which will mean that where you are going to sit and remain for, there for about some 70 years, you'll be handing down decisions of serious political ramifications. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. To the extent that the, the constitutional provisions have been negotiated, they represent a political negotiation of what the rules going forward should be. In life, everything is political. Even what you hand your children to eat. It is partisan politics that we usually take issue with. But the essence of having a constitution 
is that it better guarantees the right of the individual as the different organs of government stay within the space that they've been allocated. And so the individual is the better off for it. It sets out how we may do things, how we may not do things, what our entitlements are. It guarantees our rights. It doesn't even grant them because rights, we say, precede um, are inherent in um, being human. So it is a political document. You can't get away from that. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. Let me join colleagues in congratulating Professor Henrietta and Sabon. So congratulations, Madam. Um, First of all, I want to find out from you if you, I'm sure you, 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 you have publications before the nomination of Madame Jane Mensa to become the Electoral Commissioner suggested that you were considered for that post. Uh, have you ever been approached? for the post of electoral commissioner by uh, anyone close to the appointing authority or the appointing authority themselves? Mr. Chairman, this was a very difficult time for me. Nobody had approached me for anything. <laughs> and yet I kept seeing headlines. Somebody even had a headline explaining why I turned it down. <laughs> It, it was a very difficult time for me. People were saying, hold a press conference. And, and I said, what are you going to deny? Nobody has offered you anything. What are you going to deny? So let's just say that I won the popular vote. Thank you. <laughs> Would you have accepted it, though, if you were uh, contacted? Um, I may disagree with the honorable member because that is a position at the level of Court of Appeal. And I believe that with my track record, I ought to move and aspire higher. Thank you. Now, um, I, will want, I want to find out what your position is on sexuality, sexual abuse, and the desire by some people for sex education to be promoted, especially at the basic level. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure you can see that I have a publication on, uh, uh, yes, sex, the sex, sexual offenses, and this, which I describe as sexual self-expression, because self, sexual self-expression is one of the things that we, we, that are normal to the human being and yet expressed a certain way becomes criminal. So I look at all of those things. It's a part of life, but unfortunately we are changing. And so we must do things differently. In our day, our parents did not give us much sex education. But in this day, with all the um, technology, all the media information and so on, you endanger a child's life if you do not direct the child as to the correct things to do. I know that it is the work of parents. But if parents neglect that, Guess where the children learn it from? From their peers, not from school. So it is important that children be exposed to these matters. After all, their sexual organs are part of their body, and they are bound to ask questions about them. If they don't ask the parent, then they are asking somebody who will give the wrong answer. So I think parents should step up to the plate so that if whatever is offered in school would be in addition to what the parents have taught them. Because there are issues of 
morality as well. And you cannot leave your children to be guided by somebody else's morals. Well, I was hoping that uh, your answer will not be uh, directed uh, to the domestic, but uh, because of the publication that I have come across, you will situate the answer within the context of our laws and, and, and perhaps how um, we can ensure a balance between the need, for example, to uh, punish sexual abuse and also not to expose our children or our society that much to uh, sexuality, even as we desire or hope to get our uh, young ones sexual, sexually aware of, 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 of who they are and what they can do. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, there are sexual predators, and there's nothing you can do about that. And sexual predators tend to reoffend. It is one of those recidivist crimes. People don't change. And so you must protect the young ones. And a lot of the time, they manage to um, get their victims not to complain and so on with threats of you will die and so on. If you have given your child the necessary exposure and education, they will know that they won't die, that somebody is abusing their innocence. In my article, I talk about even our housing arrangements. It was common when I was growing up that in a household and in a, a compound house, if a young bachelor came to stay in the house, it was common for a, a parent to assign one of the daughters to help this uh, person fetch water and do the kinds of things that in those households women do so that they would support this young man. Often this young man would be a teacher who had come into the village or something like that. It was done. But look what has happened now. Again, in our traditional setup, our roles are very gendered. Men deal with men, women deal with women. Then we move to the city when those things don't happen anymore. Then you have serious situations that you must deal with. Then you have the law presuming that parents are the best protectors of the children. And yet, in this day and age, we hear of, parents, of fathers who abuse their own daughters, sometimes even to the extent of not wanting to pay their school fees unless they allow them to abuse them. Things have changed, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Prof, some mothers are now offering to marry their sons, so it's not one way. <laughs> the abuse of children, some mothers are offering to marry their sons. As I said, <laughs> as I said, the world has changed. Chama, is this in Ghana? <laughs> in Uganda. Ah, okay, not Ghana. <laughs> Prof. All right. Prof, let me... Um, I, I listened to you on uh, a radio station once, and you spoke it was a personality profile interview. And you said something that touched me. It had to do with your choice to abandon law practice so you could take care of your children and your home and be a good wife, as you put it. Now, there seemed to be a certain misconception about feminism and what it seeks to do for women. In the context of the Affirmative Action Bill, which I know many people, including yourself, had advocated for its passage, how, how, how do you think you know, women, or if you like, the female gender in our society, will be protected? as they are faced by these choices every day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me take the opportunity to correct an impression. What I said, or what I intended to say, if what I said did not go down well, 
was that here was I copying other people. And that I learned from that that you must never do things because other people are doing them. That you must make sure that your own circumstances enable you to do those things. I had taken a decision to teach, and that requires your full-time attention. So doing other things really should not have been part of the equation. But I, I just went along because that's how uh, my male colleagues are doing, until I had a little domestic crisis. Then I realized that, as our people say, if you don't use both eyes to look into a bottle. And I had to make a choice. So it is, it, 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 the point I was trying to make was that you should not let other people lead your choices. You know your situation. You know your priorities. And that's what you should do. And not copy other people, because their circumstances may, may be different. That's the point I tried to make. So let me get to the point that you, you, you made. You see, when you talk of affirm affirmative action, you are seeking to correct a historical injustice. If women are going to be able to compete in the same way, then some things have to happen. Yes, we think that uh, taking care of babies belongs to the women. Really? When the baby has two parents? So it should be possible for us to have arrangements that enable both parents to play their role. We have inherited images from our mothers and grandmothers who were stay-at-home wives. There's a, a, there's a whole lot they can do that somebody like me having to report to class to teach will not be available to do. And the system must support young women to be able to do these things. After all, the children are the next generation of citizens, aren't they? And so why should it be just the burden of the woman and not the burden of society? So you are just trying to give people a leg up so that they will be able to carry on from there. Sometimes some decisions are made, and you know that this decision was made by a man. Oh, is that? <laughs> somebody, not too long ago, somebody was doing um, online training for something. And the person was doing it at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Excuse me, real mothers have things to do on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Or people who, you know, ministers and so on, who drag services well into the afternoon. Children have to eat. So your young mothers are disadvantaged. It's those kinds of things that we have to be aware of, that some things sound ordinary because our circumstances are different. But when you, you pitch it against what some people have to do, then you find that it's inequitable. Right. Um, thank you. Let, let's move away from there and look at another um, national assignment that you were called upon to perform uh, recently, the Ayawaso West Wagon by elections and the attendant uh, violence that we witness. Your report was highly commended by many institutions and many well-meaning Ghanaians. And I also would want to say that um, it was a good job by you know, what I was able to uh, uh, go through. But the government white paper and the implementation of some of your recommendations seem to have watered down perhaps what your far-reaching recommendations intended to achieve. Will you say 
it's 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 an anticlimax or it's it's a disappointment for you given the effort you may have put into your work as members of the commission when you serve on a commission to advise um, the president you are guided by law the rules say that when you hand in your report you are found to official so it's not your duty to go chasing people to implement it becomes property that honorable members like you should follow up, not the, the, the commission. The commission doesn't exist anymore. It is from to official. And when, for example, judges take decisions in the courts, the judge may have really sweated over the decision. It goes on appeal and it is reversed. The judge doesn't hold a press conference to complain. That's the nature of it. Would you have wished personally for better? Well, when you give advice, you hope that it will be taken. But what I know of advice is that those who want it don't need it, and those who need it don't want it. <laughs> that, that's interesting. Maybe um, if I still have time. I also uh, noticed that you were nominated uh, by Ghana and supported even by ECOWAS for the Judge A list of the International Criminal uh, Court. Unfortunately, uh, the vote didn't go your way. Have you always wanted this to be a judge? Let's say that even at the beginning, I had two choices to teach or to join the bench. Teaching was my first choice, and joining the bench, my next choice. So um, once I work oh, my Chama, way up. Is it her post retirement choice? <laughs> post, post retirement choice to um, attend having lectures sufficiently. It's just a passing comment, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much for not needing a response. <laughs> so, having worked my way up to the point where that transition um, has become possible. I did not um, uh, resist the temptation to, it was a request by the government of Ghana that I represent Ghana, and that is why I went to all that trouble. A final one, uh, Article 1284 of the 1992 Constitution states, and with the permission of Chairman, I quote, a person shall not be qualified for appointment as a justice of the Supreme Court unless he is of high moral character and proven integrity and is of not less than 15 years standing as a lawyer. Mr. Chairman, what will you say is the correct assessment of high moral character and proven integrity? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking for myself, I've lived my life in the very eye of the public because when you teach, you are very much uh, a focus of attention all the time. And if after 30 something years, there's been no adverse complaint, you have not taken any step that you should not have taken. There are no moral question marks about you. I suspect that will qualify as proven integrity. Well, I didn't intend to make the question specific, but you made it specific to yourself. So what about those who haven't had the privilege of perhaps working in the sector that you work in? What will be your fair assessment? And what will be the fair, the fair assessment of what moral uh, character, high moral character, and proven integrity is? Perhaps you need indicators that people must uh, conform to. Otherwise, you leave it as opinions that people have. Unless you can prove that 
the person has taken some wrong step that has been a, a, the subject of a record or some official censure, it's really at the level of opinion. So maybe, since you are very interested, honorable member, you can initiate some discussion. So indicators are developed for the future so you can uh, be, be more sure that people have met this standard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Barbara. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. And congratulations, Professor Harry Tamintsa Bunsu. I just received um, a text message from some old girls congratulating you for your good work. Yes, and a lot of young people, especially women, look up to you. Thanks for your mentorship and leadership. Lecturing law is not equal to sitting as a judge who determines complex and difficult cases. How will your career as a professor of law help you discharge your duty as a judge of the highest court of the land? Thank you. Thank you very much. At the highest court of the land, the work is essentially assessing evidence, taking evidence, assessing evidence, depending upon which of the jurisdictions one is um, exercising, but mostly assessing evidence, making up your minds with the applicable law, writing judgments. And these are the things that I teach students every day, not to mention the fact that I have chaired quite a number of quasi-judicial bodies um, on campus and elsewhere. So I know that it's different, but it's the other side of the same coin. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Some people believe that in the name of impartiality in relation to which judges sit on which case some people believe that in the name of impartiality in relation to which judges sit on which case, the process of empaneling should be automated and devoid of determination by the office of the Chief Justice. Do you share this view? And is it consistent with the constitutional position under Article 1254 which makes the Chief Justice the head of the, of the judiciary regarding administration, adjudication, and supervision. Thank you. Let me say that I know that some things have gone on in the past which have got some mechanisms put in place to, um, in a sense, take out the Chief Justice's discretion. But we've got to trust somebody sometime. We give somebody a responsibility. There are many people around with different background. Why do you want to automate? With the kind of background I have in peacekeeping, if there's a case that involves an understanding of peacekeeping, why would you leave it to a machine to take a decision as to um, who, who sits on it? So I think there's a certain level of distrust inherent in automate, automate, but it's not, it's not for the general good that a, 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 we should leave such decisions to a machine. Thank you very much. This is quite personal, but you are very special. I mean, being a woman, looking at your achievements, very successful woman, who has kept the family, and Dean, looking at your CV, you have achieved so much. Can you share with us one or two of what you've been able to, I mean, your secrets over the period, how you've been able to succeed as a woman, a family person, a success, with a successful career? Thank 
you for the compliments, honorable member. Let me just say at the outset that I have a wonderful husband. Yay. And, and, and he's from Bakwa, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we've been supportive of each other's hopes and aspirations. Without that kind of support, it's very difficult. Because there have been times when I've had to travel for a period of time, and he's had to, you know, look after the children. And for me, the, the, the bonus for that kind of situation is that his daughters have a direct relationship with him, a situation in many homes where they deal with their father through their mother. I stay out of the way, and they deal with their father. So. Without that kind of support and an understanding that your happiness is my happiness, my happiness is your happiness, it won't work. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Yes. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. Uh, Chairman, permit me to also express my very deep honor in uh, being part of this engagement with um, someone who is a true legal luminary in her own right uh, in Ghana. Uh, often the, the terminology is abuse, but this is an engagement with a true and true luminary. And uh, we, we, we really are honored to engage with you. I congratulate you uh, most sincerely. And uh, we wish you well uh, when you assume that onerous duty as a judge at the, at the Apex Court. I want to uh, begin from your CV. I must indicate that you presented to us a very intimidating CV. Uh, the most voluminous uh, we have we have worked with since I joined this uh, this committee, and uh, it's been uh, very refreshing going through just a few matters of uh, interest. Page seven of the CV, I noticed that under uh, social, just uh, above the membership of professional bodies. Uh, notice that you provide the year for all your social positions. The past president of Akrai Boni Lions Club, 1998, past zone chairman, zone 161, that's 2002. But for the past vice president of Wesley Girls High School, uh, you don't provide the year. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, are you please able to help us with that? Thank you, sir. I, I just couldn't remember the years. I can check, um, but I find that some of the dates and things I did not note earlier. By the time I came back from Liberia, I had forgotten even some of the clothes I owned. So I've never really checked, but if you uh, um, are interested in me providing those years, I, uh, there are people I can check from. Chairman noted uh, uh, <laughs> the, the Honorable Minister for Local Government says she remembers the year she was uh, Vice President. <laughs> and uh, membership of professional bodies. I also note that for the two listed above the Council of Foreign Relations, you do not provide a year, fellow Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Ghana Bar Association, uh, but for member Council of Foreign Relations, you have in bracket 2019, uh, uh, the, 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 just for clarity, does, were you just a member for 2019 or are you still a member of the Council for Foreign Relations? Let me indicate that I was I was honored to be at the inauguration uh, of the council. Uh, it's a very worthy effort. Ghana has lacked this 
uh, I mean forever uh, since the coming into being of this country and uh, I, I commend you for this effort but uh, uh, the way it's been put here uh, have you left the council or are you still a member of the council? Thank you very much. Maybe it's because it's so recent that I put the 2019 there. I'm still there. Um, I had indicated that the responsibility seemed to be more onerous than I could undertake, given my many other undertakings. And I was assured that I might be able to move to a different category. So maybe that's why I did not add more than that. Finally, on the CV, it's a, it's a lighter matter. Um, on page 23, under hobbies, after more than 10 books you have authored, more than 30 journal articles, and so many other chapter contributions of books, over 40, you list as your hobby reading. There must be something else to you. Uh, it appears that it's all reading and writing. Uh, I don't know if Chama will accept this hobby, but don't you don't you have another life apart from <laughs> reading? Mr. Chairman, cookery used to be my hobby, and um, devising new recipes and so on used to be my hobby. But when the children grew up and there was nobody to eat when you cooked it. I, I, I stopped and gave that up. So it is only um, in reference to the uh, true situation that um, now all I do is watch Food Network if I have time to see the competitions and the uh, recipes. I once had a dream that I would own a Ghanaian restaurant, but I think it will remain a dream. Uh, very interesting. How lonely so, it is to grow up, isn't it? <laughs> I said, very lonely when you grow up, isn't it? Well, growing old is lonely. But fortunately, I had guidance from my mother that it is lonely, so expect it. So you, you develop new hobbies, you gain other interests. I listen to the radio a lot. Um, I read for pleasure, um, and, 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 and I, I'm okay. When you have done your work well, your grandchildren live with their parents, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prof, do you have uh, room, do you make time for mentorship of young ladies who are not your students? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a number of young women have decided to attach themselves to me. I'm quite happy to mentor them, but they also must make their own way. You cannot be a second edition of somebody else. And you cannot feel that you have not been successful because you are not just like X. You don't have to be. So giving them confidence to make their own way, absolutely. But um, they have to seek you out. Mr. Chairman, I want to now come to the substantive questions uh, for the distinguished professor. I intend to begin with your work serving on the commission of inquiry into the Ayawaso West Wagon events. I hold in my hands the white paper which was gazetted by government on the 13th of September 2019 and signed by the Leonard Attorney General. On page five of the white paper, the government wrote, and I quote, the fundamental response of government to the findings of the report is that the report failed to address the first and most critical of the terms of reference of the commission, which was, quote, to make a full, faithful, and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events and associated violence that occurred during the Ayawaso West Wagon by election on the 31st day of January 2019, unquote. The failure to do so disables government from accepting in whole the findings of the commission, unquote. 
have you reflected on this uh, position taken by government? And uh, you're going to the Supreme Court, people, these are now academics, researchers who will be looking at your work and what, what, what government response has been. Does this in any way take something away from your, your capacity? Do you think this was an indictment on the work of the commission? Not at all, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is customary when people draft appeals to say that the judgment is against the weight of the evidence. So I do not see it except in that light. And enough of the recommendations were accepted for that not to be wholly correct. So yes, the language may have been infelicitous, but the Constitution uses the lang that language. So anybody who wants to um, question something would be right to use that language. But I, I don't think it, it questions our um, competence in any way, no. I noticed from my copy of the uh, report as published on the 14th of March that your commission chose to refer to what is popularly called vigilante groups as party-associated militia uh, on page 15 of the report. Are you able to elucidate on, on, on why you chose uh, to refer to these groups as party-associated militia, which, uh, by the way, government did not agree with you on? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We thought that the manifestations of the phenomenon as is occurring in this country is less deserving of uh, a euphemism like um, vigilante. But now that there's a vigilante act, the state has made a choice as to how those kinds of activities will be considered. And so that is how we will refer to them. But we did think that th there were manifestations that needed to be categorized that way, yes. At page 22 of the government white paper, there's a matter which uh, generated control, uh, I mean, considerable controversy. Uh, many people even refer to you as the authority that we should all go go for your books and lesson notes uh, that it would not align with this particular uh, position. I read item number 6.3b, quote, the government does not accept the commission's recommendation that Mohammed Suleimana must be prosecuted for the offense of assault, to wit, the slapping of the honorable member of parliament, Mr. Samuel Nate George, on the basis that the commission at paragraphs 6.1 and 6.2 on page 55 of the report accepted the facts which led to the said assault on the honorable member of parliament, Mr. Samuel Nate George, which facts support a valid defense of provocation for the assault, provocation for the assault. Your, your views, uh, respected professor. I believe I can deliver a lecture or two to, to straighten that out. So in other words, the learned attorney general got it wrong for a record. Is that what you're Maybe saying? they are contemplating making it applicable. I myself have written, not published yet, but I've written on why I think it is inequitable to limit the defense only to when death has, has been caused. So who knows? <clears throat> so the professor, I want to now come to a matter I've made my habit since we started this year in, in this COVID-19 times, COVID-19 and, uh, and, and the law. The United Nations has been concerned that governments may use the need to impose emergency measures to, as it were, encroach the 
personal liberties, violate human rights, and, and what have you. And indeed, the European Council has also issued some guidelines to, to guide governments in the European Union. In Ghana, there has been some criticism of EI-63, which in the name of contact tracing, government can demand from the telcos. It will be legal for the telcos to provide information on mobile money transactions, bank details, your contact details, and all of that. It's being referred to as the, the spy EI. Uh, a lawyer, something Ladia Yenini, has written extensively on the matter, and I've, re I've, I've, I've read his rather lucid uh, articles on this issue. There are some other human rights lawyers who have taken issue with that EI. Have you averted your mind to that EI, and what views do you have to share about maintaining the public health, but also guarding against an erosion of rights? Mr. Chairman, these are difficult times. The state has police powers. And when there's a public health emergency, some of those powers can be evoked for our protection. Now, the problem with this COVID situation is that we don't know from day to day what is going to happen. We don't know enough about this virus we are all terrified. That's why we are all now highwaymen or practicing to be. <laughs> we are all terrified. And in what I call the pandemic, we are responding more out of panic because we don't know. And fear, fear is produced by um, fear of the unknown is a, a, a very dangerous virus in itself. What I think the situation is, is having to balance what needs to be done. I'm thinking of the doctrine of necessity. What needs to be done versus what may be done. Once governments are sure of how intrusive some of the things they must do would be, we would expect that proportionality would be their guiding standard. The things that they do not need to resort to would not be resorted to. But in the current situation of fear, I'm afraid any, any check that you try to put will be read as you are a friend of the virus. So it is important that those who are given executive power exercise the power with this appreciation of proportionality. Don't do more than you need to do, because we are having to tell people who we have, who we have visited, who we have spoken with, where we've been, and all of that in the name of a public health emergency. It's unavoidable because we don't know enough about the virus. But I should hope that the more certain we are about the virus or the closer we are to getting treatment, some of these more intrusive and more invasive aspects of the um, management of it would, be, would, would have to be looked at. Thank you, Professor. Professor, I want to take your view on the... That will be your last one. All right, thank you, Chairman. I would will, I will like to know where you stand philosophically on the matter to do with the LGBTQI community. Um, our laws remain conservative. We remain a very conservative society. Um, I, rem I recall uh, Moses Fuam in his group and the chief imam and religious leaders have uh, 
reached out to political parties to make sure that in our manifestos for the 2020 campaign, that is expressly stated that we will protect uh, the conservativeness of Ghana and not open our doors to LGBTQI. But others say it's a human rights issue and that we should uh, give in and uh, allow those who have that sexual orientation to legally express themselves accordingly. What is your view about LGBTQ? Do you think it's time for Ghana to open up to that? I haven't seen anything in the public reaction to see that it's time for Ghana to, and you talked about Ghana being conservative. If that's the nature of the society, then conservative cannot be a pejorative word. So you may allow certain kinds of conduct, but you have to understand the sensitivities and the sensibilities of the majority. You need to protect minorities, but not at the expense of majorities. So I would say that in general terms, I would want to see the manifestation of that position before I, I say something definite in one way or the other. There are lots of things we would love to do. There are some people who are born naturally covetous, but we don't allow them to take everything they want to take. So we need to be guided by the specific situations, and then we can deal with them. But I would not use conservative in the way that you use it. It's not meant to be a pejorative word. But, but any personal views, um, Mr. Chairman? Honorable that was your last one. Yes, but it's just for clarity. I didn't quite understand what her personal position is on the matter. I have friends who are gay. I work a lot with people on the international circuit. It should not make a difference. I should not discriminate against them because of their choice. But I also don't approve of people ramming something down my throat because that's what they want. So we need to hold the balance. Okay. Uh, no, let me give Jato before I come here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And let me also join Hans in congratulating Professor Harriet, Harrieta. Harrieta, Henrietta, yeah. Hen, 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 Mensa, Mensa Bonsu. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Prof, um, many hold the view that the CJ, uh, the CJ's uh, administrative, judicial, and uh, uh, financial administration powers impede his judicial functions. Uh, do you also agree with this assertion? And do you also ag do you agree that we should decouple the administration function of the CJ from from the judicial function? The CJ wears many hats. He's both the head of the judiciary and also a justice of the Supreme Court. I don't know how it's going to be possible to give all his administrative duties to somebody else for him to concentrate on being a judge. It's a, a two-hearted situation, and it has to be managed that way, because the head of the institution has to have financial control. It's only in this country that many people don't worry about where their money comes from as long as it comes. <laughs> and when people are running an organization, they, they don't even know how, they leave everything to the accountant, no. The head has accountability for both operational and financial matters. So I, I wouldn't hold with the view that it's too big. It makes you too important. It is an important job. Thank you very much. My next one has to do with the uh, UNICEF report, which states that 21% of Ghanaian age 5 to sev uh, 17 years are engaged in child labor. And it went further to say that 14% are engaged in hazardous work. And they explained the hazardous work to be farming and fishing. In our cultural setting, 
prof where we need to follow our parents to farm and the like. And I must admit, it's even affecting the purchase of our cocoa bees. I do hold the view that following your father or mother to farm during uh, uh, vacations and uh, weekends uh, constitutes child labor. Also, learning a second trade constitutes a child labor. The, the, we should always understand that there's a difference between child socialization and child labor. Child labor tends to be harmful to the child's development. But if you are bringing up a child, the child must be socialized according to your culture and traditions. So you cannot be like some other people who hold other views. When you are growing up in my house, of course you will learn to cook. And you will learn to scrub if you go to a legal high school. Because you can't live in debt and you must eat. So socializing the child so that the child um, can function in your community is part of what it takes to make a Ghanaian. The extreme is when the child is so loaded with work that the child has no opportunity to go to school, or if the child is in school, to even do homework. That is troublesome. But I will not count that as child labor. But when you take them to break rocks and uh, do all kinds of things, that stop them from going to school. I, in, in, in class six, I was in a school close to the beach around Kolebu. Uh, I had a classmate who never came to school on the days when the nets came in. He preferred to go to the beach, help drag the net, and get some free fish. You would find him definitely in school on Tuesdays because there would be no uh, fishing. But other days, depending upon whether the net was coming in or not, that is troublesome because at, at a certain point in time, it will interfere with a child's education. But we need to grow up as Ghanaians. And until our lives are a little different, we must understand that some people are looking at uh, these. If you look at somebody's culture with a foreigner's eyes, you are bound to see things that are not there. You are bound to think they are not very sensible because they are not like you. But you do not have the, the end all and be all of what it takes. So we must watch it so that it doesn't interfere with the child's development. It doesn't interfere with the child's growth. It doesn't interfere with the child's opportunities. But we can't raise children who don't know how to do anything. I visit an orphanage at Dodoa as part of my land club's um, commitments to, to help the children. I was shocked to find that they don't have a garden, even though they have plenty of land, because they've been taught in school that child labor. And I said, who taught you that? For you to even have a garden competition as to who can grow the best okra is child labor. Who taught you that? So we must understand that you are raising children in an orphanage to be dependent upon charity when they have plenty of land and could grow some of their food. So we, we just need to understand that there's a difference between how we raise our children and how others raise their children. But we must be sure that the way we raise them don't take away their future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Prof, I, of, I want to look at your social humanitarian services your humanitarian services all through, and uh, taking up this appointment where you'll be deprived of your social contact with the general public, because generally, generally ju judges um, don't mostly mingle with the general public. How, how do you uh, balance the two? Yes, I, I enjoy being a lion, but every time in its place. When I joined the UN, 
I was advised that I had to stand down my membership because my position was such that I was not to be seen favoring any particular group. And so I stood my membership down for the entire time I was there. I only took it back up when I came home. So every time and its place. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairman. And let me also join the chorus in congratulating Professor Renata Mensambunsu on her nomination to the enviable office of the Supreme Court. Uh, I used to get scared of the name because the first day I met her in 1986, it was a friendly meeting. And uh, it, it, it led to my expulsion from the law class at Legon. So that's good. I've always uh, admired your firmness. Chairman, I'll ask for some lazity, because uh, my first question has to do with a paper, something that is dear to my heart. And I've talked about it for some time. Uh, the politics of inclusion and exclusion of traditional authorities in Africa, chiefs and justice administration in Botswana and Ghana. It's written by Setri Jibenu uh, from the University of Edinburgh. And in this, he tried to look at the contribution of traditional authorities to the dispensation of justice in Africa, and especially in countries where chieftaincy is very important. And he historically, he analyzed the benefits to society. In recent past, one fundamental judgment of the Supreme Court virtually took away the authority of traditional authorities in dispensing justice in our traditional setup, in our communities. I think the case, is it Ajampofu? This is, I've forgotten the case. Um, don't you think that this erosion of traditional authority and that recognition of their right to arbiter and also dis dispense with justice within their community it's one of the reasons why we're having this backlog of cases in courts, and also possibly the uh, erosion of our traditional sociocultural values. Thank you very much. Uh, this, um, yes, it does touch a nerve. At the same time, we have adopted for ourselves a constitution that binds everybody who calls himself or herself Ghanaian. That means that people should have the same rights. Our traditional authorities do very well in their traditional areas. Unfortunately, so many people now live all over that they are not subject to particular um, uh, traditional authority. How do you deal with that? How do you put people who are subject to a traditional authority under a burden that others are not subject to? The, the Republic recognized the importance of, the, of traditional authority, certainly in dealing with issues that pertain to that institution. That is why there's a, that track of a, a course or matter affecting chieftaincy. In, in domestic matters and so on in the communities, they still um, hold court, they still give decisions. But if people do not accept that authority for them to give the decision, and they are citizens with rights of access to the courts, then it's difficult not to see their point. Their authority remains a moral authority. And once we have agreed to live together as a unitary state, subject to the same constitution and so on, the laws cannot be different 
for different people. So it's a pity, but in the areas where the authority is really accepted, they function. They do customary arbitration. The Arbitration Act recognizes that they can do, um, the ADR Act recognizes that the customary arbitration conducted a certain way is acceptable. So what we can do is to um, empower them. It's not every chief who um, has the distinction as Nana here has. So if we can um, give um, some training. I was involved in a program that trained people, you know, religious um, and traditional authorities around the country on, on ADR in the beginning when we um, worked on, on the concept. So we can empower them to do what they do better so that people will accept. But we cannot let a group of people be subject to disabilities because of where they come from. Everybody should have access to the courts. But we can do, if the, what they do is done better, people will not even resort to the courts where it takes too long and all of that. Unfortunately, it's a development that we have to accept once you adopt a constitution. Thank you. And I'm so, my second question has to do with personal beliefs and principles. In a lot of jurisdictions, um, at least some of us have had experience of listening to uh, vetting of Supreme Court judges in other jurisdictions. And most of the time, their personal beliefs and principles are also brought to the fore. Um, I know you are very, as a very strict Methodist. But let me say here that if I'm not going to trouble you too much, can you elucidate on your personal philosophies on question of abortion, the death sentence, adoption, and solicitation, and whether these things would, in a way, influence your decisions as a judge of the Supreme Court? Can we answer? Sorry? And ignore their sites and address me. Yeah. I have personal beliefs, but that is not why I should impose them on you. So with the death penalty, for example, people talk about why it does not reduce crime, the fallibility of the system, and so on. I came to that position from a completely different angle. I once worked at the prisons as, during my national service. And there was a case that we had to investigate. And so I got friendly with one very elderly prison officer. And the, the way he described, apparently he used to be an executioner. And the remorseless way he described how hanging was done told me that it is a system that dehumanizes those who must implement it. We should not put people in the situation where they get up to go to work in the morning and they are going to kill somebody and hold his neck and push him this way. And you, you. I said, this is something that shouldn't happen. So I don't look at it from the other side at all, but from the side of those who must do the execution. It dehumanizes them completely and brutalizes their senses. Abortion. The, under the um, Criminal Offenses Act, there are strict circumstances under which abortion is permitted under our law. I have no issues with that. You had some adoption. A very welcome situation for us so that we can match needy children who need care with adults who want children to care for. Wonderful system for me. I don't have any issues at all. So let me just say that I, I really don't 
have any strong views on any of the things you've talked about, except the experience with this old man who was describing to me how you grabbed a person from behind and you... Solicitation. Generally, at, uh, at common law and uh, so on, what we call commercial sex is not permitted. But it is the only offense where only one party gets uh, handled. The, the seller is dealt with and the buyer is left off the hook. And I have a problem with that. So <laughs> if we can both make both buyer and seller culpable, then but generally, at, generally, the idea is that the best things in life are free. So you shouldn't sell some things. But I think it unduly penalizes the female when the powerful male who is ready to buy is not censured. <laughs> Madam, the next one has to do with your experiences across the world. Um, possibly one of the most experienced persons when it comes to listening to people who have been involved in genocide, in conflict crisis, and all those things. A lot of these were as a result of electoral disputes. What lessons did you learn in some of these areas? And what advice will you give to this country, Ghana, in order not for us to also fall into that river? Thank you very much. Let me say from the onset that I do not believe that there's anything like a good war or a bad peace. When law and order breaks down, the human being is an animal. The kind of things people do when there's no law to restrain them makes you know that we, the, our, our veneer of civilization is very thin. And we all must guard the legal order. Because when law and order breaks down, nobody is safe. That said, I would urge Ghanaians to understand that there's nothing like a good war or a bad peace. Everything that is fought with violence, in the end, is settled by talking. There's never been a peace agreement where the people went and boxed. They always sit, talk the problems through, write commitments and wave it around that they've signed the peace agreement. If we are going to go there in the, in the long run, what's the point of destroying the little we have in order to get there? So we need our leaders to be mature. We need our leaders to understand that their influence on their followers may take them lengths that they themselves would never contemplate. So we need to appreciate the weight of our words. When I'm teaching um, complicity, uh, abetment, I always remind or tell the students about this, um, this situation in history that formed the plot of the, the book Murder in the Cathedral. The, the king and the bishop were in a contest. In history, it's called the investiture contest, as to who had power to invest who and so on. So this king, I think it was Henry II, or one of those Henrys, goes on and says, this, won't someone rid me of this turbulent priest? 
his knights fed. They rode and went and killed the man in the cathedral. I doubt that when he said, won't somebody read me of this turbulent beast, he meant that his people should go and kill him. But when your followers are trying to please you, they will anticipate what your every need is and give it. So when you are a leader, you have to remember that there are people for whom your word can mean life or death. Lila, on the note of life and death, you are done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to congratulate my sister, who is also my room's wife, <laughs> and I'd like to uh, share the various complimentary words that has been expressed here. And uh, I don't think I'm going to go uh, I have about two questions to ask you. <laughs> uh, going through your CV, on page three, I know that our educational system has been uh, dynamic in a way. I, got, uh, I saw in the CV and the committee served, uh, committee served and the University of Ghana there was a committee on preparation for reception of SSS students into the university. I would like you to share with us what actually prompted this kind of uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you. When the country changed its education now system to adopt the SSS, SSS uh, system, moved from O level and A level, the university had to ready itself to receive a different crop of students. The O level, A level system was seven years. This was going to be three years. And so clearly the, the, the university had to be ready to receive students a little less prepared than the, those who had gone through secondary school for seven years. So we had to uh, plan what the university needed to do. It is from the work of this committee that the four-year uh, degree program was uh, developed so that we could um, handle this group of uh, students who were not like those we had been um, handling before. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to find out whether you believe in changing some aspect of our educational system. I'm looking at uh, the way we come out. Uh, I think that school system is such that everyone is only geared towards certain profession, profession instead of looking at the technical aspect of our development, we are only looking at certain aspect of education, which we believe must be, uh, I won't say we believe, I want to seek your view on whether there is a critical need and at what point in the child's development should we determine which direction or which profession a, a child should pursue. Thank you. Generally, we have not served technical education well. And that's a price we will continue to pay because every form of education has its role in the economy. We even set up those days, we called them polytechnics. And then they were training more art students than uh, uh, technical people. So we need to get our bearings right. We are not going to go anywhere if we don't give attention to technical and vocational education. Some people are of a certain bent. I can't sew to save my life. But some people are earning a living sewing without ever having been formally trained 
people have different talents. So we must make it possible for those who have those talents to exploit them and also have a good life. But if the economy doesn't open to allow such people to have a good life, then everybody will go where they think they will, they will have a good life. But if you are not well suited to a certain place, you just won't be able to make a success of it. So we need to give attention to those who have those skills and offer opportunities for them to upgrade their skills so that I know that, uh, at least I don't know if it's still happening, but people were importing workmen from Togo and so on because our people don't finish work well when they've done, they've laid tiles and things like that. Can we create opportunity for people with those talents to reach the height of that um, trade and live the kind of life that we would have lived if they were, you know, whatever uh, profession you want to think of. So we need to give attention, definitely, definitely, and to encourage those who have those talents to exploit them instead of trying to be clerks when they would have been fantastic bricklayers. Thank you very much. Uh, looking at your background and your world of experience, <laughs> I find it very interesting, and I think I must ask this question. If you observe a party in your courtroom with a case, but being poorly presented by an unprepared or ineffective lawyer, how would you handle the situation? I'm just looking at your background as a lecturer and now as a, a judge. Thank you. Um, at the level of the Supreme Court, there may not be that many situations where that, where that happens. But I've been trying, and I'm glad you asked the question, because when I'm harassing my students to, to, to think and to be thorough and to prepare, sometimes they think I'm talking too much. So I'm glad you've asked the question. So they will know that so much hope is imbued in them by the people who hire their services, that you cannot afford to show up and not do a good job for your client. One of the papers I've just written is about counting and being counted on. All that paper is talking about, and this came from a lecture I delivered at the Faculty of Law, University of Cape Coast, that when you are a lawyer, you count for something. So you must be counted on that you will do a good job, that you will represent the people who have trusted you the right way. So let's just say that I'm trying to avoid the situation you have asked by getting them now to appreciate the importance of doing right and preparing for every assignment. Thank you very much, Honorable Elijah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> the The Leonard of White. Is, the chair, don't mind those who are harassing you. Be firm in the chair. Congratulations, um, Professor H. No, the way the papers were presented is H. John. No, H. John. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, in the area of peace and conflict resolution, this thesis of, uh, of your CV is full of experiences, papers you presented on peace. You must be a peaceful woman. <laughs> but how 
can we in Ghana uh, get the elements of things that can make the nation peaceful? We already have a National Peace Council. What else should we have in addition to that? Thank you very much, sir. On the international circuit, sir, you'd be surprised how much our peace architecture gets plotted. Because other people don't have a peace council organized in the way ours is. So we have a lot to be proud of. But we must empower the council to do its work. A lot of the time, we have fine institutions, but sometimes we don't give them the funding for them to do what they have to do. But other people don't have them at all, and they envy us for the council that we have. And the council is doing its best. It has averted all kinds of situations. Because we didn't hear about them, we think they didn't happen. But the council has been doing a lot of work with the little that they are given. So I would say, let us support that peace architecture to be strong so that it can um, do the work that it has to do. In every society, people, there are fractious um, elements. And when people have issues, they must have an opportunity to peaceably resolve them. To not have an opportunity at all is sometimes the reason some things happen. If you have nobody to complain to, nobody who will take up your course and reach the other side to talk, you can have issues. So I think we have a very good peace architecture, but we must give it what it takes to do the work well. Mr. Chairman, still on peace. Um, no, not on war. On peace and conflict resolution. Um, is it not about time for us to introduce um, courses in our various institutions on the study of peace and conflict resolution? It is part of the what is taught at the Legal Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy, and also the Department of Political Science. But if you, by that you mean generally peace education, I couldn't agree with you more that starting from the lowest levels, the NCC could make a, a, a difference there. Because in all the countries that have peacekeeping missions, it is the task of the human rights section to help nurture a culture of peace and respect for human rights. And so they start these clubs in the schools. And the whole point of it is to make them those ideas such a part of the growing up of children that they can they are more likely to peaceably resolve their conflict than otherwise. So I agree with you that we should start from when they are very young and teach them how to manage their differences without resorting to violence. The issue of conflict sometimes is also arising out of our different differences, either in religion, culture, or other otherness. People see each other, or oh, these people are like that. These people are like that. Fortunately for us in Ghana, uh, we've been trying to weld ourselves together. But what else more can we do so that we see ourselves more as Ghanaians than say, oh, he is from here. He belongs to this group and all that. What else from your own experiences all over the world. What do you think we should do to have this country integrated? Na nation building is not an easy task. And welding a variety of groups, heterogeneous community into a whole is also not an easy task, nor does it take a short time. 
there are some things that put societies at odds. Inequality is one of those. Unequal access to national um, resources is one of those. Inadequate education and educational infrastructure. So everything we do, we must do it for everybody. Of course, there are challenges because we are not so wealthy and so on. But if we can do these things and people put a premium on peace because with peace they have some things, they will not seek to destroy it. But nothing frustrates a society more than when some people can see others enjoying things they can only dream of. Then they don't think they have a stake in the system. And so when they are destroying it, they don't think they are doing anything wrong. So we, we have to pay attention to all of those things that make it possible for a Ghanaian, however born, wherever born, to aspire to do the same things. OK, thank you. I was actually coming to leadership, but no, please, we, 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 it's, it's, we've had enough. The Honorable Minister has requested for a opinion to uh, congratulate her classmate. That's all I'll give her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, and I'm not going to ask the nominee question, but to use this opportunity to congratulate her. She's my classmate from high school, lower six, upper six, all through the five years of university. And I'm proud and so happy that today she is definitely with the endorsement of this house going to sit in the Supreme Court, the highest court of our land. We've all seen, talk, talked about her accomplishments, that there's no doubt that she's a knowledgeable person, she has experience, and she shares this experience. But she also has a very full life in the sense that we don't know about the social side of her. She likes to interact Thank with people. Thank you very much. She has, a good, <laughs> she has a good relationship with people. Thank and Mr. You. Chairman, I like to say she will only but enhance the status of the Supreme Court. Please speak, speak, for her. speak through right, wrong, follow the king. Yes. Uh, is that the, the wiggy song? Here is honorable leader. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I take the opportunity to congratulate the nominee. And to, so I wanted to look at her CV. I don't know what it is by her. Page two of the CV. On the employment history, she said, University of Ghana, July 2018 to October 2017. Yeah, 2007. As what? The mic, please. Sorry. I apologize. I had to break my service in the University of Ghana into two so that the UN one would find a place. So I should have indicated that uh, as a lecturer to professor. OK. Uh, and you see that it follows with the UN United Nations Organization, November 2007 to October 2011. That you didn't tell us what you were doing there. And then virtually similar to the following one, University of Ghana, November 2011 to July 2018. So maybe you could just. Actually, she has explained all that when oh, she sorry. was giving us that. I just want to find out did you retire July 2018? Yes, Honorable Member. In the University of Ghana, in order not to disrupt the academic year, we all retire on 31st July. So those of us born after 31st July of a particular year get to serve to the, till the following 31st July. You would agree that if I had to leave the, the lecture room on 29th October, 
2017, some students would have been in trouble. I just want to find out the legality of that. Because they, they just followed by giving you contract, just the following month, which meant that they could have gotten you to retire on the right date and just make sure that three, four, five months before you retire, they prepare to give you the contract. Because legally, you are supposed to retire at age 60. And everywhere in the public service, three, four months before you retire, they write you to draw your attention that your date of retirement is due. You think that that is not problematic? That, that is correct, but even the Constitution anticipates that judges can't just walk off the job even when they are retiring. That's why they give them some six months to finish their part heads. In, in an educational institution, it will be unduly disruptive. No, no, what I'm saying is that in your case, because they knew they were going to give you a contract, if you were just retiring to leave, that would be different. But because you are going to be on contract, and they knew, and I don't think that it was after you retired that they anticipated that they were going to give you a contract. Yeah, so once they knew that, they should have just allowed you to retire, and then they give you the contract to continue. Sorry, it's not special to me. I know. That is what I, that's why I was asking you whether you thought that the arrangement that the universities have, is, does not, it, it falls on the face of the law. There, there are all kinds of categories of staff. And I'm sure that the Constitution means well by fixing that retirement date. And we all agree. But the problem is if you implemented that, there would be total confusion. And I don't think the university would bless that. Because there are all kinds of categories of staff. It's not just teaching staff. who And, and it's only a category that gets the contract. So it's not everybody who gets the contract. Well, I, I have argued, and Chairman will argue a number of times around this table and in our private discussions. I have insisted that if there's one category that we need to do look at to amend the Constitution, is the lecturers, because the older, the better. So maybe use the yardstick of fitness to practice as a yardstick instead of just using the age, because sometimes Yes, they may be old, but they may be very useful. Just to move on, uh, on page 7 of your CV, I noticed that member, academic board of the university, 1997 to present. Even on retirement, do they allow you to serve on this leadership role at the university? Because I know that they, it is only the teaching. But do they allow you to continue on such a board? All professors are members of the academic board. So when you are given the post-retirement contract, it's on appointment as professor. So uh, So you continue? Yes. Oh, OK. I, I, to say continue is because I had an issue with them. I was, I, I now am, but I was the, the assessor for humanities. And when I retired, and got the post-retirement contract, they assumed that it would continue. And I said, no, I have to be appointed afresh. I was a representative of the academic board on the appointments and promotions committee. And I said, no, I have to be appointed by the academic board again, because I retired. And they did that, and I'm back doing that, that, that work. So yes, it wasn't continuing. It was a, a, a fresh mandate, yes. So that means, uh, from what you are saying, that means uh, the description here should have also been broken down. From it, 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 1997 to date. Yes, because I became a professor in 97. And that's what I'm saying. From what you have just explained, mm. after you retire, you insisted that they have to reappoint you. Not to academic board, oh, okay. but as assessor of humanities. Oh, okay. We okay. have assessors for humanities, assessors for sciences. Yeah, and we understood. have to be part of every appointment and promotions um, uh, or committee. So, um, and I was representing academic board. And so they thought that, well, I was still around. Yeah. And I said, no, I'm in a different category. When you become professor, you attain tenure. Mm. When you, before you are a professor, you are on contract. So every six years is renewed. Mm. When you become professor, there's no renewal. Okay. When you retire, you are appointed on contract, this time on two yearly contracts. It's a different category altogether. OK, understood. 
From your seat, I noticed that you've done a lot on uh, reproductive health. Is that right? So I want to believe that you are very familiar with the Children's Act. I have argued even on the floor of Parliament that the right for a child to have sex at 16 years was the right of that child, uh, of a girl or a boy to get married 18, for me was problematic. Having worked all these years in this area, will you agree with me or you think there's some special reason why we think that the children assisting, they can have sex without necessarily, uh, what do you call it, they can consent to sex. But for them to get married, they have to be 18. Do you agree with, or do you think there's some special reason why this arrangement is not? Indeed, I agree with you and I have pointed that out in my writings. At the same time, there the, the is the problem of if you raise the age too high, then in a situation where you are trying to even fight child marriages and you are not being successful, it would be self-defeating. At the same time, to keep the age low and to keep the age of marriage at 18 does create this gap where, as you say, the child can have sex but cannot marry. But maybe that is a consequence that is better for us than making the age of marriage 16 years, which would be um, violating all kinds of international commitments that we have made. So not everything can be neat and tidy, but we live with it. This is where I make reference to your earlier answer to your question, where you said when you want to look at your culture in the eyes of some other persons, you may get something else. Yes, yeah, because I mean, almost all of us, from uh, Binduri to Accra here, from the west to the east, almost all the cultures, regardless of religion, frown on premarital sex. Now we have a law that because we want to meet an international uh, obligation, we say the children can have sex for almost two years before they get married or they can consent to sex before they can get married. And Madam, you and I have chaired the health committee, and when you talk to a lot of gynees, they tell you the kind of pregnancy and the challenges that come with all that. Don't you think that it is time for us to stick to our law? If we think that the best time for children to be able to do that is 18, let the marriage and the consent to sex be synchronized. Honorable, I would have loved to agree with you, but we also have to be realistic. Policing it would be impossible. And you are saying that the girl cannot consent to sex until she's 18, which means any sexual contact would be criminal. That would also have its own repercussions. So as I said, it's not neat and tidy, but you don't want to let 16-year-olds marry nor can you police that they should only have sex when they are 18. Anyway, let me move on. The interstate succession law, and I can realize that you've done some work on that. And the law, if my memory says me right, since I came to this house over a decade and a half, have been to this house several and failed in my view, because the emphasis of the bill tend to be on spouse. And I tell, and I've said it very loudly when we're looking at the principle of one, at one time, that for me, I'm the biggest insurance for my mother. And if you take me away, and probably with my siblings, and depend and take everything that we have to our spouse, our mother will have to beg. But she has spent all her life to bring us up. And yet, when we are making this kind of laws, we tend to forget parents. Because if it is spouse, if for any reason it is my wife 
who passes on and leaves me, or me leave her, depending on the age, they may be able to cope with either getting new married or do, continue to work. But today, my mother, who is alive, is weak, and I'm her only insurance. I am of the view that well, if we want this thing to pass from Parliament easy, we need to look at that composition about parents. And secondly, children. Because even in what we brought, the emphasis, like I said, is on spouse and not even on children. Children could be younger. And we know if uh, the spouse is the female that lives to leave the male, he could go and marry another woman and forget about the children. The same with women. Sometimes, yes, the propensity rests more on men likely to carry away and leave the, 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 the children. Do you agree with me, as well with parents and emphasis on children, or at least with one of them? Honorable member, I understand where you are coming from. But the intestate succession law, with all its faults, is a default position. If you don't agree with the provisions, then you make a will. With testamentary provisions from you, those will be respected. Because this happens, this kicks in when you do not make arrangements, when you die intestate. So if you die intestate, you can solve the problem your way. So what you are saying, I can understand. Take steps to protect your mother under a will. And, and that solves it, because there are all manner of situations also where without an interstate succession law, there would be great hardship. It has many faults. I've written, I've written about them in, uh, on many occasions. But it is better than nothing. So take steps to make a will. I always tell people, in fact, that it, making a will is a responsible act. Because you know that once you've been born, you will die. Well, but, uh, when you are traveling, honorable member, when you are traveling from Asawasi to Accra, I don't know where the family is based. You tell them what to eat. You tell them who to go to when there's, there's, there's need for money so that you can reinvest. You give them all these instructions. When you are going away forever, then you just go. <laughs> and leave the state. <laughs> and leave the state, which doesn't know the, your, your domestic arrangements and your domestic pressures, to make arrangements. The arrangements would be unsuitable to your particular lifestyle. So my advice is, write a will. Then you can dictate what your circumstances should provide for when you are no longer around. For us, I, I agree with you, yes, the best way is to make a will. That's why I'm saying that when we now anticipate to promulgate the interstate law, our emphasis is where my problem is. Because yes, ideally, to make a will is the, the best. Many t at times, uh, the tendency is that, oh, I'm, I believe that I'm still giving birth to children, but if I make a will and before the next will, I, another child comes, I don't go to update my will, what happens to that child? And all those things, I know, but if, like you said, each time you are traveling, you try to, to leave somebody to watch your back. But my worry is that when we are making the instances law, why are we not proportioning the emphasis in a way that holds the society? Because I can bet you, it is the reason why it has failed consistently each time it's brought to the house. Because anytime we go to clause four, we we'll argue for one week, and then the speaker realizes that if he doesn't put the bill aside and pick another business, then the bill will remain, will hold the house for the rest of the city. So, oh, okay, can we pick another bill and come back to it? And we never come back to it. And my memory tells me that we've come to this about or two or three occasions, three about three parliaments. We just do that, and then it fills us up. Why are we not going to be realistic and look at 
having something that is half a loaf, in my view, is better than having nothing or just keeping the, the current arrangement as it is. What is your take on that? Honorable member, I, I am glad um, you more than me can do something about the situation. <laughs> So, if it is an unsuitable position, then you can change it. If it's not that simple, we would have changed it. Yes, <laughs> it's not. And I'm just saying that please understand that it is the default position. If you make arrangements, nobody is going to come from outside and sort your household. Your mother is alive and you need to look after her. I agree. I also have an article on maintenance because I think it is inequitable that parents are held responsible for not maintaining their infant children, but adult children are not held responsible for not maintaining their elderly parents. So I understand where you are coming from, but we cannot use your special circumstance. My brothers are here. Our mother is dead, so that's to do anything with your property. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, in, my, in my case, maybe the will will just be a one sentence. When I die, distribute in accordance with the Mohammedans, and that's it. <laughs> it will not even be up to a, a, a half a page. It will just be a one line, and, and then that's it. Anyway, uh, Mr. Chairman, the nominee as a law lecturer and academic of great repute and who has written extensively on legal matters, how does she assess the current state of legal reasoning in our court? Legal reasoning. Legal reasoning in our courts. Honorable member, is this an offside trap? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my lord, I want to ask him to um, clarify or zoom in on the specific area because Ask him to pass a judgment or the police is going to join him. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm not talking about necessarily, I'm not even talking about Supreme Court here. I'm talking about the legal. The okay. legal. Yesterday, like I was reading, I didn't want to uh, keep us for long. You have caught yesterday, one of the justices agreed with me, uh, saying, they say, oh, uh, I've looked at your case, it's unmeritorious, and therefore the case is dismissed. Of Without you even giving the any judgment. Yeah, I'm talking about yes. Oh, right. Some write the judgment, just the verdict without the reason. The reason. That's what yes. you're referring to. I believe that's why there's the Judicial Training Institute. Because in the past we are, because in the past we assumed that everybody who had gone through a certain training could do certain things. But experience has shown us that you can always do better whatever you have to do with uh, more capacity building. And so um, the Judicial Training Institute certainly makes it possible for such um, infractions, in my opinion. Because if the person is going on appeal, what is the person going to appeal against? So um, the Judicial Training Institute should be able to um, do something about, about that to help it so that it doesn't happen. A lawyer since 1982, right? For so. Are there, is there any judge or judges that you believe their judicial approach and attitude to adjudication you admire and consider to be fair and balanced? You admire. Honorable member, honorable member, I think that every case dictates how it is handled. So it will be difficult for me to answer the, the question. Sometimes the most conservative judge in some aspect becomes the most revolutionary in other aspects. So it's difficult to pass a judgment. Yeah, that was why I was asking for maybe a judge or two, because I believe that over this period of uh, over three decades of your interactions with court students, uh, reading cases, uh, maybe there's somebody that you may want to mention, or you don't, you don't want to, uh, you 
don't want someone to say that, oh, when you were missing, you left me. Thank you very much for understanding, sir. <laughs> That's uh, my last I've question. Been in the academics all this period, and I mean, your, your CV speaks a lot of how extensive you've been, I mean, very detailed. And I must also admit, in the, the Iowa Sioux Commission, initially when you were mentioning, I was a bit skeptical, knowing from the uh, Reconciliation Committee. But I must admit, you, you proved many of us wrong. You were very strong. I mean, you spoke your mind. You were very forceful. You believe that these years of academic uh, research and academic work has prepared you enough for the Supreme Court? Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much, sir. Part of what it takes to write is to critique judgments and uh, teach students what to look out for and what shouldn't have happened and all of those things. When you've done this for years and years and years, then perhaps it's a situation of physician heal thyself. So um, I, I would say that uh, having critiqued enough judgments, perhaps it's time to offer myself for critiquing also. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I wish you all. I would brief as possible and to ensure that my closing comments are as short as an old woman's dance. Uh, prof, university lecturer exiting now to Supreme Court. I know, Chairman, and I'm sensitive to it, as you observed, that the Chief Justice Nana SKB and Professor Remo Atuga have all been sitting for long hours. We don't intend to keep you further more. But university, would you want us to adjust the retirement age, given your experience, from 60 to 65, or to where you are heading towards at 70? What's your view on that? Towards at 70, what's your view on that? The university did find a way around this problem by offering two yearly contracts for those who made the professorate so that every two years, they know also that at this time of your life, your health is not what it used to be. So every two years, subject to good health, they would renew the contract till you were 70. That was the position until a year or two ago when um, the Auditor General complained, and so um, from 65, you can, you can still be kept but as a part-time lecturer. But the part-time rates are so atrocious that the private universities are very happy to take your people and pay them better. So we are hemorrhaging, so to speak, um, of the people who have attained 65. So definitely, I would say that uh, if we can at least get back to where we were. Where were we? Or Every where two were years, Sorry. subject to good health, you get a, a contract when you make the profession. No, but contract and just making it a permanent part of your life, which one would you opt for? I didn't want to be overambitious. 65 course, years, the lawmakers but, are here, your students But of course, here. if we are going to change it, then I would say the 70 would be fine because once you attain 60, you lose your tenure. Right. And you become subject to the two yearly contract. Every two years, you have to prove, my dean is here, so I'm not going to say too much, but every two years, you have to prove that you have done enough work and you are healthy to be, to be carried on. When Chairman, thank you. Many and years ago, you'd stop Prof, to do you serve on the National Development Planning Commission? Yes, I do, sir. Do you intend to combine that with your high Office of uh, Justice of the Supreme Court? Not at all, sir. Some things are going to have to change. Should we expect naturally that you'll be quitting or resigning from that office? Oh, absolutely, sir. And absolutely. Chairman, I have learned two lessons from the professor who undoubtedly have contributed, as I've said, from her reading to particularly our criminal jurisprudence. If you've read the criminal 
procedure act in particular, you have enormous respect for her. Bailable and non-bailable offenses. As you sat home and the Supreme Court took a decision on it, how did you feel? Let's say that I was thrilled that my article on bail was cited in that case. I thought it was a, a, a Section 96 had been inserted during a non-constitutional era when the value of the human being was not like under a constitutional era. And I thought it was inequitable that it should remain on the books. So I am thrilled that the, 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 the courts now have the discretion to do what they have to do. So in my article, I insisted that the right to bail is actually a right of the judge. Because Thank you. That's appreciated, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Chairman, I've learned another lesson from the nominee. Uh, maturity with our words, including political office holders like me, and then settling peacefully from events that uh, emanate violently. But when you were uh, expatiating your thought on solicitation and the buyer and the seller of a woman and a man, buyer and a seller, those are my words. Yeah. Uh, chairman, it led me to corruption. Part of our difficulty as a country in dealing with it as a criminal offense, as I've read from you and many others, is that it's the only crime where the two parties benefit from the commission of the act. That makes it difficult. So is that like the buyer-seller in this instance where one profits from the exploitation of another and then turns around to say that uh, there is no adequacy or adequacy of uh, compensation? Now, how do we make corruption a high-risk activity in Ghana? Thank you very much. The category of crimes you, dis you, you mentioned in, in the criminal law are described as victimless offenses. But are they really victimless? I think that we need a proper code so that we can, you keep hearing cultural arguments and so on, but we can have a code that defines what amounts to corruption. Currently, everything amounts to corruption, including if you are unable to manage your weight and you start gaining weight, they say, ah. <laughs> that was noted. So I think, so, so I think you'll be surprised how many people, I once chaired a committee of inquiry when I was at the prisons, and the, the, the people had diverted some essential commodities, those of you who remember those times. And so a, a committee was set and I was the chair. A witness who appeared insisted that before he had, he, had, he had incontrovertible evidence of corruption, because before that person joined that panel, he couldn't even afford a full proper meal. Now he eats yam and sardine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need a code so that there's an agreed standard. So in the yeah, UN, Sadi, could only remind you of the 1979 era mm. of Ghana. Yeah. In Thank the you. UN, you, um, when you are given a gift and it is more than $250, you have to turn it into the Secretary General. You cannot accept a gift that is uh, higher in value than. So, in the end, the things you get are these little, little things. Nobody has a problem with it. But here, we don't regulate, and, and it's a problem. So we need a proper code. Then we need an office. The UN has an ethics office. So when I joined the UN and I declared my assets, and including anything, anybody, that you are a, a, a member of its directing council or whatever. At that time, I was a, a, a director of Stanchart. And I was asked why 
I wanted to remain a director of Sancha. And I said, oh, there's no, uh, that bank is not in this country. They said, no, prof no, no, whatever it is, you cannot hold it. So I had to resign. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Just one more on Ayawasu uh, Wagon and your observation as it became a significant blur on the conscience of our democratic practice. Yes, over time we've had party activists be at each other, but not when you have state security agencies engaged in excesses. Now, whilst answering the Honorable Ablaquer's question, uh, provocation, is it a defense to criminal assault? That's why I offered to give lectures. So that those who don't know will learn from you as I'll learn from you. Yes, um, under our law, it is only available when death has happened. So if you were to situate the white paper, the government white paper to, to, to the provisions of Article 296, will it satisfy the minimum test under it, a government white paper, exercise of discretion? Was that discretion in tandem with the provisions of Article 296 of the Constitution? I wouldn't raise an error of law to the stature of a, a breach of constitutional discretion. I think, I think uh, really we are talking apples and oranges. Definitely it was an error of law, but I don't think it is a matter of constitutional discretion. Uh, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Thank you very much, Chairman. Chairman, my conclusion, I mean, oh, yeah, it's my last. I'll keep to the way. It's just an observation. While serving as a young minister, I'm sure I was then at Minister of Trade, and this question has to do with your role at Lesia, and probably what we all commonly can help strengthen and improve in pursuit of foreign relations. I wrote to a mission abroad as a minister, and this is my concept of foreign service official as a diligent officer for the state of Ghana. And I was dealing with a U.S. company we needed to do some engagements in Ghana. I believe it was Bloomberg Grains. Then I write to a foreign service, a foreign mission in the United States to guide me as minister before I took a decision in due diligence. I find a letter coming from our foreign embassy giving me all clear that I could proceed with the transaction. Then 48 hours, I get a signal from the U.S. Embassy in Ghana to be cautious going forward with it. That meant that in the training of our foreign service officials, I mean minister, he is not in the U.S. He doesn't know a particular company comes. You expect the foreign service official to provide you diligent basis. Then they give you a letter that all is well, when in fact, by the U.S. system here, they found something fundamentally wrong. Do you think the training of our men and women at Lesia will need to take advantage of circumstances of this nature? Thank you very much. Yes, we expose them to um, all manner of, um, all aspects of the diplomacy. But you would also agree that the situation you discuss it's a specialized situation. So maybe the person you asked was not somebody who knew much about rogue companies, for example, and so took it at face value. Oh, that's the office, nice building. And uh, I went there and they received me nicely. So they are a respectable company. When the person should, not, should perhaps have checked records and things like that. So, I would say good in-service training would be helpful. And then we should start getting more specialized, even in service, because the world is moving towards specializations. Not everybody can know everything um, into the detail that they must. So uh, I would say, yes, we we, we, we can do better, but at the level at which we get them to train, perhaps they might not 
be in the position to offer the kind of advice that a minister requires. But if I may ask, did you write through the foreign minister or you wrote directly to this person? To the foreign okay. minister and to the Ghana mission abroad, not to any individual person, but the correspondence which came did not, in my view, conduct a thorough mm. diligence. So in training our foreign service officials, I just thought it should be an observation. But without wanting to keep you further, Chairman is to congratulate the nominee as I've observed, except that I've borrowed her words, invasive and intrusive. If we find EI 63 invasive and intrusive compared to Article 18 of the 1992 Constitution, which protects privacy of communication, and Ghanaian citizens, whether dealing with MTN, Airtel, Vodafone, or any service provider, does not feel secured with the protection of their data. That conflict, what will be your advice dealing with it? And on that note, I thank you and I wish you well. Mr. Chairman, we have allowed all kinds of technologies into our lives that have breached our walls of privacy. Google Map can show you a picture of your house. You can see the picture, but so can miscreants. And yet, we have all bought phones that already has that uh, app on it, and we use it happily to find our way around traffic in Accra. I'm saying times have changed, things are changing. So when there's a public health emergency that requires us to be intrusive, then we should restrain ourselves from doing what is not necessary. And that's why I was saying proportionality and the doctrine of necessity should be our guide. But we are all terrified, so. Very well. I, on that note, I want to ask a question on governance of the digital world, social media. Should users of social media be subjected to all the laws or rules of the ordinary publications as uh, operates in the print and other electronic media? Mr. Chairman, I think so. Mutatis mutandis. I think so. Because now you will not have somebody hijack you with a, a gun on the highway to take your money. But you will have somebody hacking into your account and taking your money, all the same. So life has changed, things have changed, and we must change accordingly, because otherwise we have a problem. For instance, social media has undermined one of the most fundamental assumptions that we were trained with. I'm sure all of you have heard the expression, book no lie. So whatever we saw in writing, it was the truth, because there was gatekeeping in uh, print media. Now everybody uh, is a citizen journalist. So there's no gatekeeping anymore. So you can't even trust what you see on social media. The young people always tease us, the BBCs, that we are the worst offenders of sending uh, forwarding uh, fake news. Because we were trained in a system where when you receive something in that way, it was true. It's a different world where people can do creative writing and start passing it on as, as, uh, as non-fiction. So yes, those rules must apply. The last one, I'm not sure whether I want it as a, um, a question or a comment. Taking care of babies, why should it be the responsibility of the woman and not both parents? I want to contrast that. In our everyday parlance, growing up as a young man, I knew that paying for cost of all kinds at home was that of the man. At least in my home, my father was responsible for every cost. And that's what I do now. So why should I also be responsible for taking care of babies? Well, you see, 
Your father contributed the money and your mother contributed her labor. And together they had a product. So if your wife is also contributing money, then you also have to share the labor. But it has personal benefits for you as a father that you have such a direct relationship with your children that it's a the, it's the blessing in old age. Otherwise, you'll be one of those fathers who can't carry a conversation with a child. And when you are old and your father invites you, come, let's chat. You sit at the edge of the chair. And with the slightest distra distraction, you are off. But you can sit with your mother all day. So it's a price they pay for not being involved. Well, I, it's the part about responsibility. If I could provide money and you take care, we are both responsible. Right. So long as we accept that, I'm okay with that. But, you know, I think that has gone into the interpretation my Lord have given to Article 22. Um, sometimes I wonder whether they are making law or... I would like to read Article 22. Um, no, 22. 3 in particular with the view to achieving the full realization of the rights referred to in clause two of this article. Spouses shall have equal access to property jointly acquired during marriage. Assets which are jointly acquired during marriage shall be distributed equitably between spouses upon the resolution of the marriage. Jointly. There appears to be some interpretation of jointly to mean that once you are married, property acquired is jointly acquired. That it appears that marriage itself is a contribution, per se. Um, <laughs> no, she's not in a hurry to answer me. She's suggesting that you're in a hurry to answer me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, so, the reading of Article 22.2, does it suggest that marriage per se is a contribution to acquisition of uh, property? There's the assumption, Chairman, that once you are in a marital relationship and you are doing everything together, everything you own is to. Haven't you been in a. a at a wedding service where the man is saying, I'll share all my worldly goods with you. <laughs> no, I haven't been to one. <laughs> At least I didn't. <laughs> well, um, we thank you for attending upon the committee. We know that we'll get the opportunity to do the, what we have to do as, as a house so that we, we take away uh, the intrusion you are bringing into the law. <laughs> but before I discharge you, let me recognize yes. Mr. Kwekumen Sabunsu. Of, uh, yes. <laughs> Nana SKB Asante. <laughs> yes. He's also a professor of law. Um, Dr. Richard, sorry, <laughs> Mrs. Nana Ekwian Kumasari. Right. Dr. Richard Bamfo, <laughs> Professor Raymond Atubiga, okay, Atuguba, right, the dean, okay, Mr. Alex Bamfo, Nana Ofori Bamfo, okay, um, Mr. Samuel Mills, Professor Justice E. N. A. Kote, okay. Mr. Albert Essien, Mrs. Yah Bami, oh, right. Okay, I saw, I saw, uh, my Lord, the Chief Justice has been recognized earlier, I don't know, uh -huh. but I think I saw uh, Christine, yes. Mrs. Christine, they would have Yeah, you're there. Yes, okay. I, if I refuse to recognize her, I would have done my class a great disservice. <laughs> and a host of other judicial service and members of the judiciary, we thank you all for coming to assist the nominee.
Mrs. Vesables, who? Oh, okay. And all members of the academia who came to support her. We thank all of you for coming. Mrs. Vesables, we thank you for attending upon the house. We will um, get back to you. Thank you very much. You are discharged. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the honorable members.